Indonesia is building a new capital on the island of Borneo called Nusantara. It is expected to be fully ready by 2045. But the plan is to have some government institutions move to it from early next year. President Yoko Widodo has been a major backer of the project and just last month was in Singapore to encourage private investors to foot a majority of the $32 billion price tag. So I suggest you, don't wait too long. Don't just sit and watch. This is a golden opportunity that is very captivating in Indonesia, which all of you can be part of. Everything will be fine. No need to worry. Your investment in Indonesia will continue to be safe and also the continuity of Nusantara Capital Cities development. Nusantara is being developed because the current capital, Jakarta, is sinking. Rising sea levels coupled with subsidence have clouded Jakarta's long-term prospects. Also, the government argues Indonesia needs to redistribute economic prosperity. Currently, this is concentrated on the main island of Java. But it's an economic argument not everyone is convinced of. This is where airplanes could soon touch down. A VIP runway is the latest item on a long wish list from Indonesia's president for the country's new capital. Some 7,000 workers are currently busy laying the foundations for a number of official buildings in what is still a vast eucalyptus forest. This is what about 5 to 10 percent of a presidential dream looks like. Slowly but surely, Indonesia's new capital is emerging from the ground on the island of Borneo. Over here, you have the presidential palace being built. And this is where the presidential residences will be. Nusantara is President Joko Widodo's flagship project and is envisioned as a green, smart city. But with a whooping $32 billion price tag, some investors have expressed concern that development may lose momentum after the end of Widodo's final term in office next year. The main opposition party in Jakarta is not surprised. What we need are new centers of economic growth, not a new palace. We aren't pessimistic, we're realistic. The business world only cares if their investment will multiply. Until now, there is no study that shows that people who invest there will get benefits. The government disagrees. Officials at the building site claim they have already received over 100 letters of interest. That is crucial because the private sector is supposed to foot 80% of the bill for the new capital. The investors would love to see that the, the government goes first, right? So that, that's why uh, most of the buildings, facilities in 2024 is being built by the uh, state budget. That to create market confidence, right? But uh, after that one, I believe that there will be a lot of uh, investors that will come. Some of them are still wait and see, but uh, safe to say that uh, the appetite is there. The construction of the new capital began in mid-2022, the government arguing that Jakarta was congested and sinking. This dam, being built just above the new capital, is supposed to prevent such problems. The plan is now to officially declare Nusantara Indonesia's new capital in the first half of 2024, just before a new Indonesian president is sworn in and potentially boards a plane to fly here. And joining me now for more context from Jakarta is Eka Permanasari. She's an associate professor in urban design and architecture at Monash University, Indonesia. Eka, Jakarta is sinking, so Indonesia needs a new capital. But the government also says the country needs new economic centers away from the main island of Java. How does constructing a new capital ensure that? Well, um, constructing a new capital, of course, is a big task. And the new aim for this new capital city is to create a new economic centers 
uh, following the Jakarta, yeah. I mean, like we we have some problems in Jakarta, and we would like to create this uh, new super hubs. But of course, we need such an infrastructure development, business incentives, and attracting industries and investment to play a crucial role in ensuring the growth and prosperity of the new capital. Now, if we are looking at the case study of this ECA end, uh, the plan is in 2025 to 2035, um, the master plan shows that they will build this ECA end economic super hub, um, which its vision is to be realized through six economic clusters. This is how they plan to do it. Um, and of course, um, there will be like, you know, for example, it's like the next gen renewable manufacture, integrated pharmaceutical cluster, sustainable agri industry, and so on. And as you can see that um, this economic super hub is expected to be benefit from also partner regions in Kalimantan, um, so mm -hmm. in, uh, in other neighboring cities. Um, but Look, this cannot be happening without the support of the investors. Um, as you can see, uh, we know that in order to build this capital, um, the funding from the government cannot stand alone. It needs a private sectors to invest on this. And I did want to talk to you about that because the government wants some 80% of the project costs, which is something like $32 billion to be borne by private investors. In fact, we had uh, the president in Singapore just last month speaking to private investors, asking them to invest. My simple question really is, how excited is the private sector? Are they putting in the money? <laughs> That's very difficult because at the moment, I think the government is trying so hard to get the investors. But let's see how this is laid out in terms of the uh, planning and also in terms of the um, regulations. Based on the presidential regulations, number 17, 2022, now this EKN can be funded by um, state budget, but also by the private uh, budget. Yeah? As you mentioned, it's 80% it's from um, relies on this private budget. Of course, there are some sentiments. Yeah, This has raised concerns about the potential conflict of interest and also influence that the wealthy individuals or corporations may have over the development of the new capital. Um, and also about the long-term sustainability relying heavily on the private funding. But without these private investors, of course, Indonesia cannot build its own capital. Um, at the moment, it seems that the government is trying so hard, but um, so far, as far as I know, um, we haven't kind of like, I mean, the Indonesian government kind of like haven't closed any kind of deal. Uh, I think the last um, investor kind of like backed off. So we haven't kind of seen that, you know, the new investors coming. Um, but interestingly enough, while the private sector is expected to contribute significant portions of the funding, um, mm -hmm. There have been some challenges yeah, in securing this investment. Um, now, what we can see, um, there are some changes in the government as well. Like say, for instance, to attract the investors, government met several funding schemes, for instance. yeah, mm -hmm. um, For instance, like the government and business corporation or uh, KPBU yeah, in Indonesian term, investment corporation between the government and state-owned company or private companies, international right. fundings special tech incentives, for instance, and all these kind of new uh, facilities that the government offers. So um, it is interesting to see how these things being laid out and, um, you know, whether this is going to be happening or not, whether we can kind of like successfully um, attract the investors or not. I, I was going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and speculate as to where this is going to go, but I can imagine that's going to be a difficult question to answer. So let's, so let's just talk about Jakarta, because you have worked in Jakarta and you have worked on the subsidence problem in Jakarta, the fact that Jakarta is sinking and that's why the new capital is being built. My question to you is, what happens to Jakarta in the interim? I mean, does it eventually sink into the seas or will people continue living in Jakarta? Hmm. Well, the fact that Jakarta is sinking, um, that it's undeniable, yeah? And 
um, unfortunately, there hasn't been any uh, concrete effort in order to kind of like rescue the city. There are some, so for instance, like uh, new pipelines, you know, to provide uh, clean water, but the, uh, the land subsidence is, is really severe, especially in certain um, points. Now, um, I know this is like a political year, yeah, because we are changing the presidency by next year. But there has to be a concrete plan in order to rescue Jakarta. The fact that people who are moving to the new capital are not Jakartans, um, especially the first stage is mostly for the civil servants, the army, the police, and so on. So it's not fair for Jakartan people to suffer more, uh, you know, for the flood and also for other um, disparities yeah, that is happening in this um, sinking city. Overall, uh, Eka, uh... If you look at the country and Jakartans in particular, how much support is there uh, for this move to a new capital? Yes. Look, um, I've seen that in the special not planning regulation that um, they have some plans what happened to Jakarta after the relocation of the new capital. So there might be some changes in terms of the uh, building use, for instance, and all that. So those are the um, special regulations or special planning regulations that has been uh, issued, yeah? Mm -hmm. But other than that, what I can see is um, that the, the main problems of Jakarta land subsidence and also the flood, I don't see anything at the moment, I don't see anything is, um, you know, in a concrete plan, yeah? Apart from the, mm -hmm. you know, making the new pipeline uh, we did have that kind of a plan to create this um, seawall, for instance. Um, right. But even so, that's being implemented at the moment. We'll uh, leave it there for the time being, but always a pleasure talking to you. Eka Pirman Asari from the Monash University in Indonesia. Thanks so much.